city was bombed and occupied. It was a very, very beautiful May 14, 1940. A beautiful, sunny May afternoon. People having nice lunches and everything, walking about and everything, had a good time. It was nice. The lilacs were blooming. The aroma was growing very wonderful. Major, the mayor from that from Rotterdam was given an ultimatum: surrender now, or we're going to bomb you. Because the Germans had a lot of power. He wanted to lay. So, but our mayor could not make up his mind, and. The Germans got impatient. So about 1.30, they started with the airplanes coming over. And I can still see the German pilot in that cockpit. He was coming so low, so low, going over the houses. And then on that plane, they had, they called them fire bombs, fire chain bombs. We saw them come out of the plane and drop them on different parts where all the people were living. And then they went away. As soon as they hit an, an object, uh, it was flames all over. And heat was very bad. And it was chaos. Nobody was prepared. No fire department, no first aid, no biggest. People were on their own. And I mean on their own. And the heat was tremendous. But we started the, the heat build up from both from four sides all around us. All flames, flames, flames. And we were lucky on one side we had a big park. That was okay, but the rest was all burning and people screaming. We could not get out of the houses because the fence so fast. And your family was Well, we we were on the square. We were fairly safe. We were in a festival, and we were we saw the bombs coming down, heard the bombs come down. My father had the door. He said, and it started to shake. The foundation started to shake. He said, now we have to go. Lucky that we had two big bomb shelters on our big square. <coughs> so we ran out the door, right to the shelter, and then somebody helped us in, you know. And I was. I just came to the United States, so I had my little doll with me in a suitcase. <laughs> and because I was only a year in, in Holland when the first war started. So we were there, and it got very, very warm and hot. So we well, stayed there. Can you tell me what a bomb shelter was like before you keep going? Because I don't think they had a okay. clue what that was A like. bomb shelter was made, it was like, it's like a, a, like a big form of like a, a tent, but it was all made from clay and, and grass uh, against it's built up like that. It's like, say like this. Comes in very big, comes like this, and with grass and some stones in it. And then it went up high, and then he had the roof. And in the back of it was a big, big opening front was a big opening, so people could jump in. The adults could jump in. We could not jump in. We had to be picked up and put in. Even at 10, they couldn't jump in themselves. That tells you how big. And how big and monstrous it was. We had two of them. And one of them, and the back of it, one bomb <coughs> went right in there, did not explode, was right, right in there. And around the corner of the street was another bomb which did not explode. It was like a big fat cigar that was right into the street. So there were two bombs there, did not explode. So, so we stayed there the whole late afternoon, the whole night, almost the whole night. And then it got too bad. And then and Duck Shoulder came through. He was very depressed and he said, have you heard it yet? We lost. The 
Germans are taking over everything. If you cannot stay here and cover your children, it gets too deep, the heart, too much heat. So somehow a truck came by and we were, in, we were put in that truck. And my father and mother had an, an older couple in the 80s. They took them with them, you know what I mean? So they were afraid, so everybody was so afraid. So we all went into that truck and we headed for the park with a big road there in between. So we were in that truck for maybe a couple of miles and all of a sudden somebody stopped us, halt. They took the soldiers out of the truck, the driver, and then the Dutch soldiers. And so Dutch soldiers were driving you, but German soldiers were stopping them. Stopping them. Because they wanted, of course, they wanted the truck, you know, oh. and they wanted the soldiers, so they got it. So in the meantime, we had to get out of the truck, and our destination was to go to a, farther down the road, there was a big uh, tennis club and they had opened the doors so everybody could come in there. But I can't recall how we got there. We did get there. But we, there must have been another truck or something that picked us up later on. Anyway, we were there, and we, the, the Germans let us come out of the truck. And my brother was small, and I was small. So all of a sudden, I see a big German standing right in front of me, with a long green coat on, with a helmet on, looked very tired, and he picked me up out of the truck, looked at me, put me down, and I believe to this day, this German soldier thought of, at that moment about his own little world. Because it was so tense. And then I was standing on the ground, and then he let his hands into his pocket. And here he took a big flap of white tucking, but it was so many times melted, and so many times where he was real toffee again. Do you know what taffy is? He wanted to give that to okay. me. He wanted to give that to me. And I said, No, no, don't take that poison. We were so afraid, you know, so afraid. Yeah. So, so even in, in the, the tension of the times, even though they were enemies, there was humanity that could be seen between, right. You're right. between the forces. They had, to, they had to serve their country, like we did serve our country. But everybody was serving. Married or not married, everybody had to go. But they wanted to they wanted take whole Europe, and they did, almost. So somehow we wound up in that in that big tennis club with a lot of other people who came from the inner city or they were there before. But they were bombed before we get bombed. Mm. And the drive them is a very old city. So those people had to go somewhere. So they were driven to our area. So we stayed there for a whole week because we never knew how we were gonna our house was gonna be saved. Because sometimes the wind was turning around, and our our whole area could have burned too. It never burned. So it was still on fire from the original oh, bombs. Our area, yeah. Not our, not our area. That was safe. I don't know why, but it was safe. But a week of fire. We, and of course, you never knew the inbu was going to make it. So the people helped each other. I'll help you take everything out. You understood. Then it was quiet again. Oh, the wind is fine. We're going to put everything back again. My father and his neighbors, the neighbors, they did that. We were not there. My mom and my brother and I were in the company over there. But it was very tense. So uh, that is, that, that is, you, you won't forget that. I mean, it's really, you know. Um, close proximity to... I'm, I'm guessing that the tennis facility was extremely packed. Oh, God, terrific. Overpacked. We were laying on straw. 
Laying on straw. No beds. No beds. Every straw. And my mom had all those suitcases. She had to be bacon in there like Dutch people have. And she was, she was helping everybody make a little sandwich. You know, she could hardly talk in the nerves, but they lost her voice. And uh, so we stayed there for a whole week. So this was always safe to go back again to our. Yeah. And, and of course, we didn't have. Uh, it was a chaos. Our fire department, nobody was doing anything. They, they came from Amsterdam, from a bigger city, Utrecht, a different big city, and our family was all in Amsterdam. So my father wrote a note and gave it to the captain from the Amsterdam fire department. He said, please, go there and let my family know they were alive. And I had an uncle that came from uh, The Hague, over the rooms, sandwiches and a bottle of milk. Understand, these times are very different. We had the bombing in Brussels yesterday morning. We have cell phones. Automatically, you can connect and know that someone is safe. They're worrying for an entire week whether or not their family is safe without any word except for word of mouth. You're, you're relying on someone else to... To, to do a kindness for you and let, let you know that your family's... Are you okay? okay? And then, of course, I, I had to remember now, before we actually went to that clubhouse, the tennis clubhouse, we did sit for a while, because it was a beautiful May night, in the park on the bench. And we were sleeping with kids. And all of a sudden, we got awake from a heavy food traffic. Food traffic. We were awake, and all we saw is soldiers coming in. German soldiers? German soldiers coming in. They were coming from the other part of the big river. They came from Belgium. But they occupied there, too. Yeah. And everybody was very tired, you could see. We were scared of them. But they were bicycles, they were a full boat wearing. So that was taken for a long time, you know. So you're seeing, think about it, you're seeing all these soldiers in helmets yeah. and uniforms with guns and not knowing what their intent is, not knowing what their destination is, whether or not they're going to stop you and harass your family. And again, what I love what, about what Mrs. Henskin is saying is that you could tell how tired they were too. She, she's acknowledging that their people, even though horrific things were done, she's still able to see the, the humanity in them. Right. And also, I wonder where, going back to the shelters, everybody was looking for their family and siblings. Stood there and called names. So we were lucky you were there, fine. If not, you go to the next shelf. Father and mother, brother and sister were all looking for the relatives because it was so, people were still at work, so everybody tried to get to a, a safe place, you know, at that moment. So some people were lucky and some people just were still in the building and they got killed with the fire. Sometimes it helps and sometimes it's fine. Yeah. You want to leave? Okay. Yeah. So, when, I mean, a couple of weeks afterwards, when the Germans were all settled in and they were every place, they took every school that we, are, we occupied from us. Because they wanted, they wanted to make a barracks for the schools. And they really ruined those schools. So, and we had no place to go. And then the nuns, and the brothers, and the priests, they found some places that was going to have AM classes or PM classes. They alternate, you know, so that we got some education. So, so your life was truly disrupted. Oh. 
There was no consistency of <coughs> routines or anything like that. No electricity. No, we had water. No electricity. And no heat, of course. It wasn't was coming. And uh, it was very difficult. I will do that in a few minutes, yeah. So, when little by little, the Allies were coming up from the, from the south, the Germans were in our area, and of course in Denmark and Norway and all the stuff were there. They were, they were trying to come down and help the Allies just to go against the Allies. The means the German soldier by us would have to be fed, and we had to be fed, so the Germans came first. I have seen uh, a big uh, car in the car, and a horse, horse, and what do you call it? Horse and carriage? Carriage, yeah, big one. Full of coal, or full of potatoes, with a German soldier behind it. If one little piece of coal or a potato fell off that wagon, the people were looking, looking, looking. So they didn't dare, they could die for it, or they got shot right there and there. So, so little by little, the food ran out. And then you have to use your imagination. And we use our imagination very well. We were still proud. There was no money involved. Everything was a change but doing things for each other. We had around the corner, we had a um, frigo farm. And we knew that she had very good potatoes for the service that she did for her company. The potato field was my job to go get the potato fields. And I had to wash it for my mom, look by the window, so there, we're used to eating the entire potato, right? And possibly peeling off the skin and not eating the skin, right? That's a waste to us a lot of times. But there's a lot of nutrition in that, and that was still being wasted in that country. But the people were smart enough to go and say, your mom especially was smart enough to go and say, hey, we'll take the scraps. We'll eat them. And when, when, when Martin cooked, he used to make, he used to call it like, almost like hamburger. He made pans for the potato fields. And I put them in the frying pan with the oil, and the same oil we used for our lights on top of our teeth. Dr. Billy, you sneeze, or call, the light went out. <laughs> so, uh, so we like, well, we're going to try to get it back on again. That's one thing we had. And then we got sugar beets. Sugar beets are this big, and that is and they're hard, very hard. And that was uh, a food for the cows during the winter. Now we made but three or four things from that sugar beet. We, we cut them up, scraped them, and, and then pressure on it, and then we got a little syrup. Little by little, a little syrup, and from that pole. From that pole, we went right down and got our room. And then we had, uh, we used to make like maybe dessert. We cut it in dices and put it on some extract on it, cherry or extra raspberry, to make it make believe it's pear. You use your imagination when you're a kid. So, and you had to use your imagination because it didn't taste good? It didn't taste good. <laughs> Want to make that clear. It did not taste good, but you need to eat. It's like, it's herby, it's herby, it's herby. But that, that sugar beet was very good. And then we had another thing that Oh. 
go no more than what it's like. God forbid if you cheated, you were going to hear. Because everybody was hungry, so we had it. And, well, the Red Cross did a lot. The Black Cross was all over the world. And they took care of the little ones. And like my little brother was about, you know, a couple of months, you know, a little year and a half. Yeah. So he got Karina on the Swedish Red Cross. And my mom took him over there. So he was good nourished, you know. But us, we were still. So, were you able to, was your father able to hunt the land or anything like that? Okay. My father worked for a, ch a cafeteria, big chain, chain. And, and they, the staff told them, come every morning, we can see what we have. Personnel goes first. So every every person that came there had like a little pail, we got a little bit of soup, or a piece of bread, a piece of dessert, whatever, whatever it was there. And then, before they opened the door to the regular public, they were standing outside the line already. But our, they took care of us and what they could do. So understand, how many of you have had to stand in line for food? Right here at the cafeteria where you're getting a full meal. How many of you have had to stand in line and be turned away from food? That there's been no food for you, nothing to eat, not, not, not something that you don't like, nothing. That happened, we knew that our, our grocery fellow, the green, you know, went to the farmers early in the morning and tried to get some stuff to the store. And knew that. So we had to get and see what he brought, you know. So a couple of times I had, it was my turn, everything was already sold. So we go home empty handed. Twice my brother and I, we decided, because we heard a lot of people doing it, we lived on the outskirts of Rotterdam and a little farther down on the highway, that's where the farmers started it. So he and I went there for a whole day and knocked on every door. Do you have something to eat for us? And we had some cookie cans. And sometimes they, it was a wonderful sandwich with ham and cheese, different breads. Sometimes they had a cooked meal already on the table. Come on in, sit down, have a nice hot meal. So strangers are inviting you in. I did that twice, and it was cold. It was a very cold winter. We had no clothes, good clothes. I grew out my clothes, we had no new clothes. So it was hard. But we were proud that actually the Lord helped us out with giving us some help in, in making the Sabbath to serve you and to pay. Please slant. Thank you. Um, could you also tell me related to the hunting about what Uncle Gerard had to do, what his job was? All right. Now, <coughs> uh, we had a big rat. And in Holland, the people like rats to bat them, bat them up and have a nice little meal on the table. <laughs> so anyway, ours, there was a big rat. They call it the Belgian kind. I mean, maybe he's big, I'm okay. So, and they ran it like, um, what do you call it again? Then they like. So my, my brother got a turban. So he was able to go into the park and take every little thing in line and put it in the bag and came home with it. Because the rabbit was lovely. There was a special kind of milk in there, too, in the general. Yeah. So that's what he did. And at one time he was, it was about maybe April or March. Shut a slant. And uh, the, the war was coming to an end. And the Red Cross was very, very active. 
and they were, they had a very big candy factory, candy ice cream factory, with a big, big yard. And they decided to help us out with sending us food. And the way they did it, they came in airplanes, the American airplane. And on the board, they tied down a big, <coughs> big uh, bag, and in the bag was butter or bread or whatever it was in there. So he was working and getting those things. All of a sudden, here comes that big board and right there in front of his food, and it broke open. And in there was all good butter, good butter. And of course, we had sick people around to see you, you know, and we use it, and we trade it. Some people we knew had whole wheat, we could ground our own wheat, make our own pancakes, you know, but we get butter, you know. So they weren't going to the store even at this point. You're going to your neighbor who you think has something that they can't fully use because they don't have enough of their own resources to make it into something, right. and you're trading. Trading, yes. Yeah. So, and that's how little by little you survive. Every, every little surprise is, was a big surprise. One time, I remember my father was getting ready to go to the headquarters for the, for the you know, He looked in the mirror, he was putting his, his, we have nothing in the house with you. I'm going to see what we, I can bring home. And all of a sudden, he looked at the window, a big red cross truck stuck right in front of him. We had a cousin, and he lived down south, where the Allies were already fighting and everything. But he was a Red Cross helper, and he was able to go through the lines to us. They knew where we lived. You couldn't believe it. We got a little good to this, a little to that. I said, oh my God. God was really looking after us. But that day, we felt rich. Rich with nothing. Understand that. Rich with scraps. So rich doesn't have to be, you know, bountiful. Because for you, bountiful was scraps. Did you have any long-term health effects due to, if it's not too personal? No, no, no. Uh, we, the only thing that we had was they call that skates. Because we didn't have enough uh, detergent to wash your clothing the right way. So you're in a pack train, pack trolley car, and you, and you had socks on, and guys had so it's been knickers. And you got skinny over, nothing, everybody had it. The only thing that helped there was three soap, a special kind of soap, and a brush. That's what you had to do because it was hard. Oh. And, and sad. But stunk. Oh, my son, you couldn't help. That's what we did. Connie, I was going to say, you might also want to tell them you have some scars on your hand from open sores. Right. Can you explain yeah. that to them? Okay. Now, um, we had no fighting at all. Only the fighting we got is from the natural. Uh, I had an infection in my thumb here because I was cleaning a pot and a piece of steel went in there and got a very bad infection that had been taken care of. In the meantime, all my fingers were open from lack of vitamin C. And they couldn't do help me. The doctor could just sit in the, in the sun in the back and just like that and that the, it will get better, slow but sure. But we had nothing. You had no, no orange juice, no, you know. Only orange juice we got actually in school. That was nice too for the Red Cross. One time we got, um, when the school was almost finished, the nuns <coughs> cut an, an orange in four pieces. And I said, 
on the playground. We had to eat it right there in front of them. I put the wheels in the garbage can. One time I wanted to take a little piece of it. It's a good story. So I, I put it in my pocket. And she said, uh-uh, that's yours. I was going to take it to my little brother, you know. And then, so, and then another week we had like, we, the nun gave us a vitamin C tablet in the class. And one time, some kind of a Red Cross dropped a lot of boxes with lemon juice with a little pork on top of it. So we were at a class there, and all of a sudden, boop, 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 all the little pork were going out because it was like getting warm. Yeah. And, and we laughed, of course, you know, all the noise. And uh, but we got a bottle of meal or lemon juice. That was fine to see. And that's sour. Yeah, it's sour. But we drank it. You're going to, because you're hungry. You need the vitamins, right? So things that we turn up our noses to, I mean, I might eat a lemon. I might squeeze a lemon onto something, but generally I'm not. How, about, how many of you are like, mmm, I'm going to eat a, I'm going to drink lemon juice without any sugar? So some of you like it. Most of us don't, though. It is good. It is. So it helps us. It helps us. Towards a certain way to get some vitamins. Yeah. Connie, could you also tell them about some of the stuff that you, I mean, you talked a little bit about, you know, when stuff fell off the trucks and the Germans, but could you tell them what happened, you know, in some of the squares with the Germans and some of, you know, your, your Jewish neighbors and, and what kind of you saw happening there, even though you were not Jewish, but what was happening? I had several Jewish friends. Same age, we used to play get together maybe a couple times a week with our dolls, mm -hmm. and and I also belong to a Jewish chorus of love. A little by little, those members disappeared. My girlfriend uh, was a nice, very close neighbor to us. I was one evening when was on the street somewhere. He lived not too far from the railroad station. And I knew that they just picked up a lot of families, a lot of families. And I see them being driven to the railroad. And in the back of the Germans, with a bicycle, just pushing them just like cattle. And they were waiting for those big to go in there to Germany. Did you realize at the time, as a 10-year-old, what was actually happening? Not really details. A little later on, we had friends, of course, all the Jewish people need, had, a, had a star on their clothing. And of course, a Dutch word for Jew was Jood, J-O-O-D. And they were like that. They had to walk around like that. And a couple of times, we were good friends with the postmaster. Came to us and said, My sister, my mom, can I walk with you? She says, Sure, you know. So, but they were afraid that we'd get us into trouble, you know what I mean? So, but, and I've seen that, uh, because the Dutch underground was very active too, very active. This is what we term the resistance. The resistance, yes. And uh, that was, they did a lot of, we had, on the corner, we had it was like a little cafe restaurant, and he was a sympathizer. A what? He was a sympathizer, meaning he... Oh, sympathizer, yeah. sorry. And he liked the jerk because he'd get money from them, afford all this stuff more. And one, one afternoon, we were shot, boom, boom. And we went to the door right away. We saw two guys jump on, on his bicycle and take off. They just shot the owner from the cafe because he was nasty. He was ratting on the own people and he was sympathizing with the Germans. And the, and the underground was strict. I mean, I had several cousins who actually 
died because when they, a lot of young men went into the woods and they were preparing how to handle a grenade. And one grenade, my, my cousin didn't trust. He said, go out, get out, get out, get out now. And he did like this. And he got killed, but the rest was all safe. Because they were, he, he knew what was gonna be explode yeah so did you see much of the um could you tell did was it common knowledge who was in the resistance or was it So they would come right into your house, the soldiers? Oh, yeah, because one time they were also looking for workers to go to Germany. They forced workers to go to Germany. They, they announced it about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, be on the stoop with one little suitcase if you're going to go to we need you in Germany. And that's how they, they did it. That's how they did it. Yeah. Well, I had a lot of cousins. So these were Danish people who did not want to go work in Germany, who had no choice. Exactly, they had no choice. And they were forced to leave their families. And I would guess that it was mostly the younger men that they took. 18 to 20. You know, so, uh, and also, what they also did to Germany, uh, you're under.